House of X number 6 is truly the origin of the new mutant nation of Krakoa. They have their sovereignty, culture, and future securely in their hands. The series that launched Jonathan Hickman's earth-shattering X-Men relaunch, House of X, comes to an end this week. It's been a very interesting ride that started with confusion, but quickly transitioned into excitement for each and every issue. So far, we've witnessed a revelation that Moira X has the power of reincarnation and has a limited set of lifetimes to secure a future for mutant kind. We watched Cyclops and his team successfully execute a suicide mission to destroy the Mother Mold that ultimately leads to Nimrod and the annihilation of all mutants. We observed the resurrection of Scott and his team and learned Charles' plan to resurrect the 16 million mutants who fell at Genosha. And finally, we discovered Charles inviting Apocalypse, Mr. Sinister, Exodus, and a host of other villainous mutants to the newly minted mutant homeland of Krakoa. In last week's Powers of Ten number 5, Krakoa became recognized as a sovereign nation of mutants. We also got our first peek at how Charles and Eric are planning governance. The 12-seat Council of Krakoa, with Krakoa and Cypher acting as advisors or overseers of some type. And that's basically what House of X number 6 focuses on. Mutant sovereignty and governance. Two very key objectives Hickman set out to establish in his new X-Men status quo. I must admit, I've never been the biggest fan of reading about governance. I'm personally much more interested in culture and adventure. One of my biggest issues with the Star Wars prequel trilogy is the volume of political maneuvering. I found it all tedious and boring, quite frankly. Being a skeptical person by nature certainly doesn't help. So I must admit, the final issue of House of X is slightly disappointing to me, but I imagine I'm in the minority of readers. But it's a logical conclusion to this portion of the story. The origin of the new nation of Krakoa and its governing body are likely to play heavily into the direction of the sixth spin-off Dawn of X series. While this isn't exactly how I envision House of X finishing, it's a very important issue that ties up some key loose ends, and I highly recommend it. Now let's get into all the deets in the House of X finale. It's time for today's House of X number 6 comic book review. I've maintained since the beginning that Pepe Larraz's art in House of X has been the superior of the two very well illustrated X-Men comic titles. This week's issue certainly doesn't change that. But before I talk about why this is my favorite image from the comic, I gotta acknowledge color artist Marty Gracia and the huge impact he's had on Jonathan Hickman's X-Men reboot. The Raz and Powers of Ten artist R.B. Silva have a similar enough style that the difference in art between the two series isn't jarring. But Gracie has done a wonderful job marrying the two together seamlessly. Unfortunately, Gracie has had some problems and wasn't able to complete the final issues of House or Powers. David Currier fills in on colors admirably and does a terrific job emulating Gracie's previous work. But Marty Gracie's color art has been integral to the storytelling in House of X and Powers of Ten. I hope he's back to work in short order. My favorite image in this week's comic is the first meeting of the Council of Krakoa. It has a very Arthurian feel to it. I like that the table is round, symbolizing no side represents the head of the table. I also like that it's integrated into Krakoa, the sentient island affording Charles and mutants the world over one last chance to secure a future. And finally, the new X symbol at the heart of the meeting signifies everyone at the table is now part of the X-Men. Terrific scene with excellent iconography, in my opinion. Pepe the Raz and Marte Gracia made their mark on the X-Men universe with the House of X visuals. I rate the art in House of X number 6, 4.5 out of 5. The story begins one month prior to the opening scenes of House of X number 1, and we get our first Moira sighting in what seems like forever. She's in the no place that Krakoa can't monitor. It's also referred to as Professor X's secret cradle, and I believe we also see Charles without Cerebro for the first time. I'm kind of assuming this is the only place where he feels safe without it with Moira and Eric. It makes me think he's hiding something from Krakoa, but we'll see if that actually goes anywhere in the future. The three agree it's time to enact their plan to secure mutant sovereignty. Charles begins transmitting to the inhabitants of Earth. He says, All I ever wanted was to love you and for you to love us. We wanted to save you, and we did, many times. 
But in return, all you did was stand by while evil men killed our children, over 16 million of them. This was a really powerful statement, and he follows it up really well. He then explains mutants have developed several drugs to save humans again, but this time there is a price. One, mutant sovereignty on the island of Krakoa, and two, all mutants can claim Krakoan citizenship. Mutants will no longer be judged by man and will receive amnesty until they are judged by a new Krakoan government. I think it's really cool that we finally get our first glimpse of the Avengers here as well. They're acutely aware of Charles' demands, and I'm very certain this is building to an inevitable conflict in the future. A Jonathan Hickman-led Avengers vs. X-Men story? Are you kidding me? That would be Marvel's license to print money, especially if they put a great writer like Rick Remender on the Avengers series as well. Charles ends his communication in no uncertain terms. These are our simple demands and are not negotiable. In return for making our lives better, we will do the same for you. And if you find yourselves asking, who are these mutants to think they can dictate terms to us? We are the future, an evolutionary inevitability, the Earth's true inheritors. That is a very powerful statement and sounds much more like Magneto or Apocalypse to me. I can't shake the feeling that we're going to learn next week Charles isn't in control of his own mind. I also find it interesting that we see Omega Sentinel and Dr. Gregor on the forge. If Charles could project his mind that far, why didn't he just take control of a couple of security guards and make them release the collars and destroy the mother mold? Would have been far easier, but also less exciting for readers, I guess. We then see the full council of Krakoa, minus one Kitty Pride, soon to be known as the Red Queen. And we get a bit more info. I thought it was odd that Scott wasn't on the council, but here we learn why. He, along with Gorgon, Bishop, and Magic, are the military captains of Krakoa, and Cyclops is the captain commander. Basically, he's the general of Krakoa's army. The council of Krakoa meet for the first time, and we quickly learn their first order of business is the fate of Sabretooth. I believe from the previous issues that he was getting off scot-free for murder when Emma Frost secured his release a few issues back. That is not the case. He is the first mutant to be judged by the council, but they haven't really established any laws yet. For as much as I don't really enjoy governance, the meeting is actually very interesting. Most of the members come from differing points of view. Jean is very kind-hearted but fiery. Emma and Sebastian are mostly interested in commerce. Nightcrawler comes from a religious perspective. Sinister is basically antagonizing and instigating other members, and Apocalypse only cares about mutants. The first law of Krakoa is put forth by Jean. The highest crime should be killing someone who can't come back. Mutants killing humans. It's then clarified killing humans in defense of Krakoa wouldn't be bound by this law. The first law is then approved unanimously. During the political angling, Sebastian Shaw brings up property rights, wealth, and currency. Cypher interjects on behalf of Krakoa and explains Krakoa is alive and warns the council to tread carefully when considering property rights. There's a bit of back and forth before Paris states, still, the boy raises a good point. This place is an Eden to us, life-giving, nurturing. There is honor to be had lifting it up. The second law of Krakoa is ratified, respect this land. Oddly enough, Krakoa appears to be the most respected member of the council. I'm not sure how this plays out, but I could definitely see a civil war erupting over the sacred mutant land. Finally, Nightcrawler's asked for his opinion, and he states, based on biblical text, we need to make more mutants. With a very devilish grin, I might add. The final law is then approved at the first meeting of the Council of Krakoa. Charles proclaims, is what we have perfect? No. What is? But it's a start, and a good one. And the council then turns their attention to Creed. Sabretooth is charged with killing a human, and the council unanimously find him guilty. Krakoa may seem like the beginnings of a utopian society, but we learn mutant justice is cruel and very unusual. He's sent into the bowels of Krakoa to remain in stasis, as Charles explains, alive but immobile, aware but unable to act on it. And for how long? Forever, Creed. For that is how long mutant justice lasts. 
I think Sabretooth would have preferred to stay in his human confinement. I definitely didn't expect anything quite this harsh, but Mr. Sinister, or whichever council member ultimately betrays Charles, has a very motivated ally waiting to be freed. And I gotta say this, I'm 100% Team Creed on this. He was tried and judged under a law that didn't exist at the time of his actions. He's got a legitimate beef, in my opinion. The council concludes their first meeting with the first three laws of Krakoa and their first judgment in hand. The newly formed sovereign nation of Krakoa celebrates. Dazzler puts on quite the display while all the mutants celebrate a momentous occasion. Everyone is having a great time celebrating their independence while Charles monologues. He and Eric look over all they have accomplished to secure a future for all mutants. But we see not everyone is celebrating. Apocalypse heads off on his own. Apparently the first mutant who is finally realizing his life's ambition isn't ready to celebrate. Quite yet. The last reference materials in the book are updated graphs of Krakoa, now including its Atlantic Islands, and nine new named points including the Danger Island training area. Bar Sinister, Hellfire Bay, the Red Keep, and the White Place are all now located on Krakoa, as well as location 18, which is ominously unnamed. I wonder if that's the location of the No Place, but that seems a little bit too easy to me, so I'm really curious what's actually there. Jonathan Hickman does a great job with characterization in the House of X finale. We get a good sense how the Council of Krakoa operates and where the main players are coming from. Scott is the general of the Krakoan armies now. There's a tremendous amount of powerful dialogue in this comic. I rate the characterization 5 out of 5. The story is mostly about sovereignty and governance. It was all really important but kind of boring as well in my opinion. I rate the plot 3.5 out of 5. If you can't get enough of House of X and Powers of 10, be sure to watch tomorrow's edition of Outside the Bleed with my good friend Skip and Tosh. We'll give our final thoughts on the big reveals in House of X number 6, as well as theorize what it all means and where we believe the story is heading. We leave the margins of the comic book and explore all the implications House of X number 6 has on the future of the X-Men, as well as the Marvel Comics universe. House of X number 6 is probably my least favorite in this series, but then again, this is my favorite comic story of the past few years. This comic doesn't change that by any means. Pepe Larraz, Marty Gracie, and David Curiel can all be proud of the graphic work they put in this comic book. It boggles the mind just how much Jonathan Hickman has accomplished in 11 short weeks. I personally think his characterization and dialogue have improved as the story progressed. House of X number 6 is truly the origin of the new mutant nation of Krakoa. They have their sovereignty, culture, and future securely in their hands. I rate House of X number 6, 4.5 out of 5 overall. I highly recommend this comic book. It's obviously must read for anyone on the Hickman X-Men hype train. This comic and the whole series is integral for the X-Men moving forward. Jonathan Hickman's House of X ignited a fire among comic book readers waiting for Marvel to do something that felt important. I hate to see it end, but I'm very excited for what lies ahead. When Marauders was first announced, it was the series I was least interested in. After taking this journey with Hickman and his creative team, I'm all in on Marauders, X-Men, X-Force, and Fallen Angels. I'm not sure what to make of New Mutants or Excalibur, but I will be reviewing the debut issues on the channel. I can't wait to see how Hickman concludes the amazing story in next week's House of Ten number 6. I hope you all come back for my final Powers of Ten comic book review. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. I would appreciate it very much. It helps us attract more views for the channel. Subscribe for future commentary, comic book news, and reviews. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications. If you want to talk comics, movies, and much, much more, you can follow me on Twitter, at Wes underscore from underscore TC. With that, Salamat Po, and I'm out.